Okay, sorry guys. We'll let this repopulate a little bit. I did in fact manage to save uh, that one because my blessed wife managed to figure out the secret stash of videos, like backup stash of videos that my phone was hogging that was using up all my space. So that will be uploaded to YouTube. Chuck, I know that's really important to you. Um, so that will be available for re-watching. Well, it's, it's shared in my live stream for the next 24 hours, but I will be uploading it to YouTube as well um, as part of the resources for this virtual apprenticeship challenge. Uh, let me just plug that for a second. So for anyone watching who is not part of the Virtual Apprenticeship Challenge this week, well, let me thank you guys, first of all, for making this possible. The Virtual Apprenticeship Challenge is a month-long carving course that I do with people um, where each week I give you challenges and we talk through, we, we, we cover different material to help you in your carving journey. It takes place in a DM list, a special DM list within my Instagram it costs 50 bucks. I think it's a total steal for the amount of information you get. Um, a lot of the information gets uploaded to IGTV and YouTube, but there's a lot of information in terms of questions um, and discussion on the thread itself that you only get if you're taking the course. So uh, the next course starts February 10th. I plan on doing them once a month, but uh, that depends on how much demand there is for them. So far, I have enough people signed up to do this next month's one. If you would like to take part, let me know. Um, so, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so if you let your rim width vary, so for me that means thicker here, where it's nice to have slightly more reinforced material, thinner here, and then slightly thicker here, it's just easier to make it look good than if you're shooting for the exact same rim thickness all the way around, because the exact same rim thickness there's only one thing that's going to look right. Whereas if it varies, then all of a sudden there's a much lower standard of what looks right. And that's a good thing. Okay, so now I've established my inner rim, right? Let's uh, turn just slightly. Because now I think it's useful for you guys to be able to see the rim here. So, so now I'm going to do uh, a bunch of cuts that are going to start establishing the curvature of the bowl because you can see how it's kind of choppy in here. And what I want to do now is establish a nice clean curve that goes all the way from that rim on one side to the rim on the other side. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the cuts are going to go from one side to the other side because remember there's a grain change in there. But one thing I'm going to do, for instance, is cuts that come down like this they either get stuck or if I come down and then at the very end I do that little twist like that and you know it's like it's almost like a J stroke when you're paddling you know how when if you're at the stern of a canoe when you're when you're paddling a canoe and you do that little uh, you paddle and then you do that little kick out and that helps the canoe stay straight forward so let's show this again I come down now I can't exit by just angling the hook knife up because I'm going into the grain. But what I can do is pivot it and you see how that essentially causes here. I'm going to see if I can capture one. What it does is it slices across the end of that cut. Essentially pivots around to slice across the bottom of that cut. So I come down and then I pivot. Now it's also very convenient that that pivot happens in a spot back here in the back shoulder where I want there to be some curvature in that direction anyways. So the whole thing matches up quite nicely and essentially what I can do is I can get a surface that, I don't know if you can see it, but this half of the spoon is almost flawless. I can get a surface that is beautifully curved with almost no tool marks all the way from the top to the bottom by matching that little J-stroke pivot at the bottom with where it naturally wants to pivot here anyways. 
Okay, now let's talk about the other side. So that's one half of the spoon bowl. Now let's talk about the other side. Again, I'm going to brace my thumb on the bottom here. <clears throat> I'm going to lock this thumb here. I don't have to. I could, I could keep my thumb back here, but I might as well lock it in. And again, you can get a lot of power with this. It doesn't mean that you necessarily want a lot of power. You have to keep in mind sort of what the curvature is that you're actually shooting for. And you're trying to achieve that now. Here, I suppose I could do a, a J pivot, but it would it would just intensify the it would just intensify the choppiness in this back corner. So I tend not to on this back corner. I tend to either leave them attached or they kind of pop off like that and leave a little jagged bit, and that's fine. But I essentially get the curvature I want in the front of the bowl, like that. Good. And now I'm left with this little quadrant here. When you look at the spoon, for me, it's from 9 to 12. For all you righties in the world, it's going to be from 3, I'm sorry, from 12 to 3 o'clock. Um, so this quadrant here is the last piece that needs to be cut cleanly in order to achieve a beautiful knife finish on the inside of the bowl. So the way I do it is I actually use the edge of my knife as a datum for roughly for what I want the edge to be. And I come down in and see how I can just pop that right out. And this takes a little bit of finessing because sometimes you can dive under too much and then you find yourself going back and forth seeking perfection. It doesn't always happen perfectly, right? There's still a little bit of a ridge there, so I'm gonna come from this side and see if I can make it better. But the trick is, you can get pretty darn close to perfect with not a lot of effort, right? That just didn't take very much time to do. Let's talk about it as I do this other one. So <clears throat> when we left off this spoon, I had my rim established. There's actually a little spot here on the rim where I need a little extra thing. Oh, ooh, and there's actually a point, there's something that I need to do on the other one. So I need to do it on both, actually. Once you get your rim sort of part way done, I've taken to doing this extra little step with the Sloyd knife, where you see how my rim is these facets that are that are slanted downward, right, like here, it's a facet that's like that. When you look at it from the side, you notice that facet, and maybe the line isn't quite as nice as you would want. So I find it really helps the overall feel of the spoon if I do one last pass with the knife, and just, especially on the sides, try and make it a little flatter so you can see what I'm doing is I am knocking off this corner on the inside and and maintaining the corner on the outside right and what that does is it gives it a much cleaner look from the side than you would otherwise get now, when you do this pivot cut, you have to be careful not to let the knife nick it right here because it's going to want to. Okay. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to need to do a little bit more hook knife work on that one for the same reason. Now I'm just going to clean up the rim on this one. Just like that. Good. Anyone have any questions while I'm, while I'm doing these? So 
So again, this is also my chance just to get that, the curvature of the top of the rim. <coughs> as sweet a curve as I can. And notice that it's not a ton of curve, right? It's very shallow curve, almost flat in most places with just a little kick at the end. There needs to be a little bit of a curve. Otherwise, um, if it's totally flat, it will pull up on your lip here and here as you pull it out of your mouth. For, for a cooking spoon, that, that doesn't really matter. But for an eating spoon, that, that's an important distinction. But I can see, let's see here. This one just needs a little more sweetening up. Okay, good. Okay, so once you have done that, you then need to, you know, that's gonna adjust a little bit how the rim is. So you then need to go back and freshen up the inside rim. So I actually tend to do that step. I should have done that step a little sooner. I tend to do that step before I actually define the inside rim. I do it just before I define the inside rim. Once I've sort of created a fairly narrow rim, that's when I do it and that's a good time to do it because then you don't have to go back and do what I'm doing right now. Um, it just fits nicely into the flow of, of carving the spoon. So now I'm just sweetening up the curvature so that the curvature on the inside is matching exactly what it is that I've created in terms of the rim. And there's also a point at which there's almost always at least one imperfection in the bowl of a spoon that you just have to walk away from. So there's almost always something that you could always chase again and again and again. And being willing to step away is important. That being said, I've also found the common issue that I've noticed with spoons I have of other carvers is that they are likely to not do quite enough right here. They need those extra four or five cuts right here to get a nice curvature to the belly of the center of the bowl. Um, and so I would say feel your bowl and see if it's perhaps too flat right in here. There should be an, a nice curvature in there. Uh, any thoughts on grain raising or stopping the grain raising once a spoon is in use? So in general, grain raising is a sign of how clean your knife finish was to begin with and how clean your knife finish was is an indication of how sharp your knife edge was. Um, so that's the first thing you can do is, is take your knife sharpening to the next level. Either that's by stropping or just getting better at the initial sharpening to begin with, taking your initial sharpening to something like 3000 grit instead of just a thousand grit, which is a lot of times people will go from like a thousand grit stone to stropping and you'll probably have a better result if you go up to 3,000 grit and then strop. Um, if you only strop with a compound but don't strop with a smooth leather strop as well, taking it to a smooth leather strop will, will help uh, with that. Um, and then also grain raising is a result of whether the, the wood was dry enough, how dry the wood was when you did your finishing cuts. Wood that is has more moisture in it, some of the fibers will tear instead of cutting and then those torn fibers will lift up and become raised grain once the spoon has been used a bunch. So um, if that's if you're struggling with that, try letting your wood dry more before you do finishing cuts or use wood that's aged more or increase your sharpening. Um, okay, so now here I'm at the stage where I need to define my inner rim. So again, it's hard to see in such a small thing, but I am going around and doing the inner rim first. And same deal, notice how I'm pinning it 
with my fingers here against the side of my hand. And notice that I'm basically ignoring everything that's happening in the center. I don't really care what's happening in the center right now. I just care about getting <clears throat> exactly the inner rim that I want. And then once I have the inner rim, yeah, you bet, man. Once I have the inner rim, now the job is to get a nice smooth curvature on the inside. Now this camping spoon is intended to be an eating spoon slash cooking spoon. So there's an additional step that I take with eating spoons, anything that's going to go in your mouth, where I, so with the cooking spoon, I just sort of arbitrarily decided what was the finished curvature. I'm not going to be so arbitrary with the eating spoon. Um, I'm going to get a nice curvature and then I'm going to test it in my mouth because your mouth is really good at telling you, right, here's that pivot across the end grain to get this quadrant nice and clean. See how I pivot and it just rolls right along that back shoulder there. There might be a little bit here that needs to be cleaned up in this direction. But then it's usually just this last bit here. Um, when you put a spoon in your mouth, your mouth is perfectly capable of telling you exactly where it is too thick or too lumpy from one side to the other side. It can tell you with perfect precision exactly where you need to remove more material. So, yeah, that actually is pretty good. Um, but quite often I find, for instance, that I need to do just a little bit more on the inside there. Okay, so now I have my I have my inside the way I want it in terms of how it feels when I put it in my mouth. And now I have um, now I'm gonna do my little micro chamfer on the inside rim. And this is going, this is particularly important in things that go in your mouth because you feel that little sharp edge. So you can use the tip of your sloyd knife and just really carefully go along it like this and then really carefully go along it like this. But there's always the danger that that tip is going to stab into the bowl. <clears throat> so then I had the ingenious idea that why don't I just keep using the hook knife, which is designed to get up out of the way. And so really easily, you just use the hook knife to create a tiny little micro chamfer right on the rim, just like that. And even though it's not strictly necessary on cooking spoons, I like to do it. And notice how um, notice how slender a cut it is. It is truly a tiny, tiny cut, right? Can you see that? How tiny that cut is? Come on, focus camera. Super tiny cut. Okay, now let's go back to this one for a second. At this stage, the inside of the bowl is done. The inner rim is done. The outer rim can now be sweetened up to match the inner rim. This is something I learned from Derek Sanderson, which is that the hook knife, because it's curved, does a better job of making a smooth curve <clears throat> on the inside than you do using the straight Sloyd knife on the outside. 
So once you have that nice curve on the inside, you can use it as the line that you want to follow. Not necessarily exactly. Remember, if your rim is widening up, then the line isn't going to perfectly follow the inner rim. It's going to be slightly different. But you can use it to tell where there are little bumps that should be brought down just the tiniest little bit. So what I do, and this is the only place where I use this sort of potato peeler cut, because it's so imprecise usually, but if you're just shaving off just the tiniest little amount, I use this potato peeler cut to just knock off the bumps. I am not, emphatically not trying to recut the entire line. All I'm trying to do is just a little bit of damage control. Taking off the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bumps. Make it just a tiny bit better. That's it. But that little detail makes a big difference in how clean the overall line of the spoon is. Now, I want to do a chamfer on the outside edge of that rim. So right here, I want to do this tiny little chamfer that's about at that angle. That's going to make this sharp edge not as sharp. What that looks like is generally going from this widest point up to the tip and then the widest point into the neck. But what you need to make sure is that when you are doing this part here at the tip, you need to make sure that your knife is angled down enough that it's going to run smoothly along the cut. If your knife is too much in line with what the rim is already, you're going to run into the fact that it's going to be uh, splitting the grain and not cutting the grain, which can be counterintuitive because you're looking down at it and you're seeing the grain this way and you're thinking, oh, there's no way it's going to do it. But you have to remember that the rim of the bowl is swooping up through the grain. And so this can be your downfall. If you don't pay attention to it and have the, the edge of your knife at at least an angle like that, right? See how far down this is angled? If you don't do that, you're gonna end up chipping a chip out of the tip of your rim at this late stage and it is gonna really bum you out. So, same deal. Keeping it really steep. Okay. It's not super critical that you get it all in one line like that. Because quite frankly, no one's going to see it. Okay. So now, with anything that's going to go in my mouth, I still have the step of thinning down the bowl on the outside because when uh, I let I deliberately left this thick so that I could make the inside exactly what it should be to feel right in your mouth in terms of holding the right amount of liquid etc and so now we're at the stage where whew, where it's important to thin it down so now now. So now I'm going to start in the middle because again that middle is going to be the deepest point both when you look at it from the side whatever you do in the middle is what you're actually going to see as the line. Um, so I'm going to start in the middle and I'm going to start just past what I want to be the highest point and sort of ghost up to it and over. If I start right at the highest point and I go down from the highest point in both directions well then I end up with a little triangle in the back. I end up with a little peak. I don't want that. I want it to be a nice curve. In order to have a nice curve, you got to start on the back side of the curve, go over the curve, and then ease it down. And that's from both directions. 
So I'm starting just back from where I want, ease into it, and then I want to, as smoothly as I can, push it all the way to the edge. And I'm going to go right up to where I want that rim to be and hopefully have the rim the thickness I want it to have. Now this is a camping spoon, so I'm going to leave this stronger than if it was just an eating spoon because I assume a camping spoon needs to go some with somebody camping and therefore needs to be slightly more robust. My eating spoons, I've been making thinner and thinner as I've found out exactly how much material you can remove and still have a plenty strong spoon. The key to having a strong spoon, I've found, is to make it slightly thicker in the middle and have it taper as it goes out to the edge. If you leave it nice and thick in the middle um, and have it taper to the edge, you can have it quite delicate at the edge, but that thickness in the middle sort of easing out to the edge just keeps everything really strong, much more strong than if you tried to have it be thicker at the rim and thinner in the middle. So, all right, I have my facets now, and now I'm just going to quickly blend my facets. I take the same approach on the back of the bowl as I do on the handle when it comes to facets. I'm not trying to sort of get a like perfect pattern of facets. I'm just I'm more trying to get the right curvature, all right? And so I'm looking at that curvature, and then to some extent. I'm going to put it in my mouth and thinking, yep, and then I'm also feeling it and feeling how much flex there is. Okay, so that feels about good. And now I've got my rim, and I'm paying attention to making my rim a consistent thickness as I go around, right? We're going to do one more micro chamfer on the back of the rim once I do this, so I want to make sure I leave myself space for that. So now on these back shoulders here, if I was doing a regular eating spoon, I would probably ease this right, this rim, keep this rim nice and tight right up to there. But because this is a camping spoon, I want to take this narrow spot and make it that much stronger by just keeping that that wide. And that extra bit of material makes the whole thing that much stronger. But same deal, I'm just working my way along, but by starting at the rim, I sort of define exactly the line that I want, and then I can let everything else follow that line. And it just makes the whole thing flow smoothly. Any questions while I do this, guys? There's, there's going to be um, some space here while I can talk about stuff. I need to do that whole thing to the other spoon as well. Um, so any questions you got? Hey, Brett. Any questions you got? Uh, now's a good time. So now I'm going to do this micro chamfer on the back. And again, you start at the widest part and go to the tip. And the widest part and go to the tip. And I'm trying to take off just the tiniest, tiniest amount. I'm definitely not trying to take the rim down to nothing. Okay, there's that one done. I'm going to burnish this in a minute. But first, I just need to clean up the back of the bowl on this guy. Now, on a cooking spoon, it's so much bigger than an eater or a camper that you're going to end up with facets. And so, if, like me, you're looking for a really nice rounded look, the trick is actually to make the facets smaller. So I'm not trying to make, with, with something like this, it pays to make big facets because you end up with just a much cleaner surface. Whereas with something like this, letting the facets be smaller means that you end up with what appears to be a more smoothly rounded surface at the end. 
So you can see I'm, I am prioritizing getting a nice long run on my facets by letting them be narrow than I am in having wide facets. And that's because I want those narrow, I want those narrow facets to blend together. And then once I burnish them, they're going to blend even more. They're not going to go away. You'll still see them. But if I keep them nice and narrow, you end up with a nicely rounded looking surface, which I like. Now, with eating spoons, I do the center of the bowl till it feels right. And then, and then I do the back of the bowl until it feels right in the back of the bowl, both of which I test by putting them in my mouth. With cooking spoons, I tend to do the outside roughly right, then I do the inside until the curvature is right, and then I just match what's going on on the outside with what's going on, on the inside so that I have a curvature that feels like it matches. So. When, I'm, when you see me taking down bumps, what I'm doing is matching the outside curvature to the inside curvature as dictated by my fingers feeling that. So you'll just see a lot of me sort of making adjustments, feeling it, making more adjustments. Sometimes I don't even need to feel it because I can see that something needs to change just to get it to match the flow from the outside's perspective. But it all comes down to the caliper of your fingers telling you what needs to happen. So for instance, one of the things that's happening right here is there's this slight ridge and there's a bit of a bump right here, both of which can be solved by doing a couple of small facets here. And voila, much better. You said this before, but why do, do I like such a long blade on my knife? Well, I like the long blade on my knife in part so I can do these long cuts being able to get a longer pivot so I can start here and then pivot is sometimes helpful depending on what you're doing. I find when I'm doing these long, whoop, when I'm doing long handles, the longer my blade is, the longer I can go down because you always go down like this so I can get a nice longer cut this way. And when I'm doing pivots, uh, particularly across really wide spoons like my oval ladles, I use every inch of that blade to reach from the center out to the edge of one of the sides there. So I just find them a more versatile blade. Um, so, okay, so now you can see I've basically done the front and now I do the back. I think not thinning these back shoulders enough is something that's pretty common among spoon carvers. These back shoulders, you want them to be about the same weight as in the front of the bowl. There's no need for them to be heavier than that. And if you leave them heavier, which is often the case just because I think uh, it's a little trickier to get the curvature on these nice, if you leave them thicker, it, it leads the spoon to have a much clunkier feel than if you were to thin it out, uh, more so than perhaps you might realize. Um, so really taking the time to and out these shoulders is nice. Now, because it's a cooking spoon and I want it to have a nice strong neck, again, I'm not pulling this rim in. I'm letting it, I'm letting it flare out like this. Um, but and Okay, good. So now I need to do the micro chamfer on the outside edge here, but I just noticed I need to do one more adjustment of the rim here. You can see how, uh, show you what I see. The rim right here is just a smidge too thick. So. It's important not to let yourself get sort of sucked back into adjusting every little thing in the spoon bowl. 
because again that opens an enormous can of worms and you'll end up over carving your spoon and ruining it but um it's useful to be able to adjust a few things so now I'm doing the micro chamfer on the outside rim again it can be nice and small just like that And again, notice how I've got both thumbs braced against the blade here, and then I'm actually controlling the motion with this hand. So it's a very controlled motion. There's no pressure coming from the knife, the hand that's actually holding the knife. Let me see if I can show you this as well. Very controlled because all of the motion is coming from this hand, and this hand can really only make very small motions to begin with. It's you get a lot of control over how um, how light you are, and having a nice light motion is key. So. Um, and now I'm doing the micro chamfer on the back side of the rim. On a cooking spoon, these micro chamfers have more to do with durability because that real sharp corner will eventually get fuzzy the fastest because um, it's essentially unsupported wood fibers. So if you can knock off that corner, you make the edge a lot stronger than if you don't. Which sounds, I don't know, counterintuitive, but it is how it works. Okay. All right. Um, now I'm going to burnish. Not sure how much time I have, so we'll see. How things are. So I use two things for burnishing I use a porcelain burnisher and a broom corn polisher. <clears throat> Burnishing is just a process of rubbing the spoon with uh, something hard. And I discovered it back before I was a spoon carver. A little hair here that I need to cut away. Uh, back before I was a spoon carver because I had a little pebble that I used to keep in my pocket from a beach in Maine. I used to live in Maine. And I would... I. If I, I forget where, but I forget. I had like a piece of wood and I was like rubbing the piece of wood. And I thought, I thought, wow, that's getting really smooth. So then I thought I could use this as part of the carving process to, there we go, as part of the carving process to make the tool marks that much smoother. So originally I was using a smooth pebble. And then I started using a bit of deer antler because I saw some carvers were using deer antler. So if you're using deer antler, and, and if you don't have access to like a deer antler from the woods, sometimes um, pet food stores will have bits of deer antler for your dogs to chew. And if you find one that has a fairly smooth surface, I took sandpaper to mine and I sanded it down. Um, yeah, absolutely. Give me a second. Um, so I took sandpaper to mine, I, it's upstairs, otherwise I'd show it to you, and I sanded it down all the way to 3,000 grit. I didn't try and remove all the little knobbly bits on the deer antler, but I just wanted to make them not rough. Um, and then I was also using a pestle, and the pestle was great because it had this nice rounded bit that was great at doing the center of the bowl, which the deer antler didn't do as well. But the deer antler was great because it had this thin little bit that was great for doing the sides of the handles, which the sides of the pestle didn't work as well because they were glazed. So then I thought, well, what if I mash these two together and see if I can get a potter to make me something that's the two tools combined in one. So I found a guy. So both of these tools, and I'll get to this one in a second, uh, I sell for $15 plus shipping, um, $10 of which goes to the actual maker. So you're really supporting people. Um, and this has a time frame of like mid-April to May, whereas this has a time frame of maybe a couple weeks. Um, 
So uh, whatever it is that you're using, you just want to make sure you support your spoon while you do it. Um, and some people burnish before they finish, before they put on the finishing treatment. Some people burnish after. Um, I tend to do it before just because that suits my process better. I'm, it's part of it lives in my tool carving kit, and it's just it's just the order I do it. I haven't noticed any difference of doing it before or after, um, in terms of if you're worried about it sealing the grain of the wood or something, then it won't absorb stuff. I, I wouldn't worry. Um, yeah, let me talk about Matt's hook knife. So I told the story. I think it was in this, maybe it was in the previous live. <clears throat> about how Matt's Manan knock is based off of the curvature from this Robin wood hook that I had reached out to Robin and said, your, your new hooks aren't as good as this early hook that I got from you. And he said, well, they, they are what they are. They're now fixed and, and automated and I'm not gonna change them. And so when Matt was designing a hook knife, he said, well, what makes my, my hook knife so great? This one from Robin. And we figured out that it was the curvature and the way it tilted over the handle. And um, and so I would say that, you know, what's great about the Monadnock is that it's, the, to my mind, it just does everything. It does, it, it does big forms, it does small forms. It's not so tight a curve that it struggles to make us leave a smooth surface on a big form. You can see there's a few tool marks, but they're, they're fairly small. Um, but it's a tight enough form that it can do my mini scoop shape without any problems, which uh, an open sweep shallow knife that is typically sold to, to people who are worried about tool marks, um, it, it won't, those shallow knives won't do mini scoops. So to my mind, it's the perfect sort of hybrid does everything tool and does it all exceedingly well. Um, if you're a lefty, I know he's auctioning some lefties now. Otherwise, I think his wait list is a couple months. But the nice thing about Matt is there's no like release of batches. You can just go to his website and order something, and it might take a little bit. But you're, you don't have to be on a wait list to then order stuff. You just tell him what you want. Um, and he and I are, yeah, he's, he has some new tools to show me when I go visit him on Wednesday. Uh, he said he wanted to do a, a new line of spoon knife that sort of brings it back to exactly how I use my tools. Um, so we'll see what that turns into. I don't know. But that's the thing about Matt is he's always innovating and pushing himself to go a little, a little bit further. So um, I once... Uh, tried to figure out if I, if I burnished for a long, long, long time, did it get that much smoother? And the truth is it does get that much smoother, but you do start to lose some of the definition of your facets. So if you want a faceted look, you shouldn't burnish for too terribly long. Notice that I do do all of the end grain places and the rim and the whole nine yards. One area where I find the burnisher is particularly nice at creating a hybrid burnished knife finished surface is I burnish the pommel really hard and it ends up all of these little facets get blended together and it ends up looking as though I sanded it even though I didn't sand it which I think is really cool um, have this alternate route towards a really smooth rounded surface so then I take my broom corn polisher and the story with these is I had a, a gentleman for a lesson who said he saw my burnisher and he said have you ever heard of <clears throat> these polishers it's this uh, I guess these French furniture makers would essentially have these and they would scrub down their furniture with this they would load up the end grain with with wax polish and they'd polish their wood and I, I reached out, I was curious, so I reached out to Cynthia Main, who makes these for me, and I knew she was a, uh, a broom maker, and um, I said, would you make me some prototypes? <laughs> I'm so curious. And what I, I thought if I trimmed them to a curvature that I'd be able to polish this, but what I find is is I, uh, 
I think if I were to take some time and like really scrub this up that the broom corn would soften up tremendously but right now it's still really scratchy and I just haven't taken the time to do it and the wood I carve is green enough that it was leaving some scratch marks although I've heard from somebody maybe it's Ben are you still here he said he did take the time scrubbed it down and that it uh, and that now he uses it in the bowls of the spoon and it's great so I'll have to work on that what I use it for is I find that this section here in the middle is ideal because it has some flex to it it will wrap around facets so the, the the burnisher only hits whatever the highest point is so if there's a facet and a facet and there's a sort of a low spot between it unless you get the angle just right you might not hit that with the burnisher but with the polisher you will because it will wrap around <clears throat> so i find that the polisher does a great job of preserving the facets while polishing on either side of them and just kicks it up that much further. And again, I don't do the center of the bowl, but um, for me, the one-two punch of those two things is really lovely. I'm glad you like them, Chuck, yeah. Yeah, Ben, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your experiments with it? How long did it take to soften it up? Hey, um, is that Steve? Steve Leo? It's like you, you changed your name, Steve. Wasn't it Craft Carving T.O.? Um, so again, I do the bowl, fair amount. Good. And now I do all around the rim. You gotta make sure that you do the inner rim and the outer rim. But notice I'm not doing it for very long on any of these. Nice move. Um, okay. So again, you can use anything hard, back of a spoon, the pommel of your knife, Anything hard works great. I have found that glazed surfaces don't work as well as unglazed surfaces when it comes to pottery, which is why this porcelain is unglazed. And it is useful to have there be a fairly large surface. It just makes it more efficient in getting spoon bowls. That's all. Nothing sacred about the shape other than that. Um, and I'm using a fair amount of pressure but obviously, if you use less pressure, you would preserve more of your facets more cleanly. So um, it's just a matter of personal preference. Um, and here I'm really isolating and using quite a bit of pressure to create that rounded surface that I talked about. And I'll switch and I'll do just a couple seconds of the broom corn polisher. The reason this has two bindings on either side is it's just from my sailing days. When I was a tall ship sailor, you would always, every rope on a ship has two rope bindings at the end, with the idea being that if one of the rope bindings gets loose, you can just chop it off with your knife mid-flow of doing whatever without having the rope start to unwind. So it's just an insurance policy. So when I designed these, I asked Cynthia to do two on either side just so that if for some reason one came loose, you could just trim it down to the next one. I don't know why I keep having her do it. Clearly doesn't need it, but I just kind of like the way it looks. So, plus it reminds me of my sailing days. <clears throat> I'm not sure what you would use for this instead. Maybe like the side of a little hand broom might work just fine. Um, and there you have it. Do I wash... Nice. You did some spots where it got really dirty, so you scrubbed it with dish soap and a scrub brush. I have not. Mine is definitely grayer than when I got it. Um, and in fact, you can see that I basically never used this side because it's nice and clean. And you can see the other areas do get used. Or maybe that might also have something to do with some purity within the porcelain itself. Did it work, Chuck? Did it? Did it wash off cleanly? Um, all right, so let's talk 
finishing treatments at this point. So I used to use linseed oil like a lot of people. Um, I read Robin Wood's blog when it came out and and I got on the linseed oil bandwagon. The problem was, was I hated how it tasted. Um, I just I couldn't stand it. And I had customers tell me that they didn't like it either. And I had been making lip balm for years and my lip balm was just beeswax and yojoba oil. And I thought, well, what if I try using that in my spoons? Yojoba oil comes from the nut of a plant uh, that's native to the American Southwest. <clears throat> and it's technically a liquid wax in that it's, uh, it's liquid at room temperature, but it's technically a wax, which means it's incredibly uh, shelf stable, won't ever go rancid, and it uh, works well at high, super high and super low temperatures. Apparently NASA was experimenting with it to see if they could use it to replace whale, sperm whale oil that's still used in some of their spacecraft for certain applications, and I guess it didn't work. But um, So I, I make this myself. I do sell tins, but I don't really sell them. I sell them basically at cost, so I don't advertise it as such. But if you want to try some, for me, they're, they're I forget, four bucks a tin plus shipping. But uh, but it's easy to make yourself. It's a two to one oil to beeswax ratio. I just get the materials on Amazon and I heat it up in a coffee can on the stove top, give it a stir, let it cool, and then I sort of smash it a bunch with a, a spoon and shmoo it into the tins. And the smashing and shmooing helps break up that hard, you know, when you get a new tin of whatever, like lip balm or something, and it's got that like hard surface that you can't get down into. I don't want that. I want it to be um, easy to get my finger down into. So the smashing it into the tin breaks up that wax crystalline structure and makes it easier to apply. So one thing I'm not going to show you guys here, but that I do is, so, so the thing I like about this mixture is that it, uh, it doesn't taste like anything. And <clears throat> and it smells like the beeswax and it, it it brings out the color in the wood without having a distinct yellowing effect on the wood so the linseed oil even if it doesn't have a yellowing effect right away over time like over a year or two it will the spoons will get yellower and yellower and yellower and that does not happen with the uh, the yojoba oil and beeswax um, so what, um, so what I do normally, um, that I'm not going to show here is that, uh, oh, that's good to hear Chuck is I, I smear on this stuff and then I hold it over a stove flame and you can see this in that little clip on, on Instagram and I turn it and I turn it and I turn it and it heats up the wood and then I keep smoothing it around because I don't want any spot to get dry because that might crack. I don't, I've never had one crack, but I don't want to risk it. And I keep smearing it around and the heat hardens the wood. So it's hard now, but if I were to hold this over the stove flame, it just makes it that much more durable and I think makes for a better product that will last longer, because especially the tip of the spoon does a lot of work. And so the harder and more durable you can make it, the better. Um, so... Uh, and it also gets the the mixture to really soak in strongly into the wood. So I, I, I keep doing it, turning it. it. It'll get so hot that it's actually uncomfortable for me to touch. And also I'll keep turning it. And then I'll, I'll wipe it down, give it a buff, and then it's ready to use. Unlike linseed oil, which you've got to let <clears throat> cure for a long time. Um, and, and so that's why I do it. I like that it's, it's immediate. I'm an impatient guy. I don't want to wait for something to cure. And I like that it has no taste, no flavor. It's not curing oil in the sense that uh, it provides a protective film, but I find that wood doesn't really need it. It's more about keeping it from getting dirty before it goes to the next person. And then it will, as soon as it starts being used, it'll develop its own patina from the actual use. Um, and what I found is that spoons that I have in my kitchen that were finished with linseed oil versus spoons that were finished with my stuff look exactly the same after a year of use. There's no difference. It's not like the linseed oil ones look much better. They both look like they could use some fresh oil on them. Um, yeah, yeah, you do the oven because you have an electric stove 
Um, yeah, so there's lots of different ways of doing it. Toaster oven, oven. Um, I think it's key to keep making sh wiping around the oil, make sure there's no dry spots while you do it. And, um, and that's it. I'm going to go salve my throat and, uh, thanks for watching guys.